Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Professor Wilfred Codrington, and I will not be able to say this for very much longer, but I am new to Cardozo. Uh, I came here from Brooklyn Law School, and I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I am here today in my capacity as co-director of the Florensheimer Center. Um, here today with me is my great colleague, my uh, Professor Michael Pollack, as well as uh, our formidable team, um, Hui Yang, who is our program minister, and our two student fellows, Jilly Horowitz and Sam Sanchez. Thank you so much for everything you've done behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, and everywhere else near the scenes to make this happen. Um, and I encourage you all to be in touch with us at the center, as including our student fellows. We want to bring the sort of programming that is relevant and helpful and additive for your education here, uh, and hopefully on relevant and timely events. We want your ideas for the types of events that will be helpful and supportive uh, for you. We'd like to organize those. Um, I said at the Constitution Day event, which was our first event, an internal event, that we would be bringing you other events with great and brilliant thinkers, and here I have them for you today. Um, today, our event is called A Government of the People, Popular Engagement in the U.S. Constitutional Democracy, and it features the three panelists to your right, to my right, to your left, uh, and two of them have recently published books, and that's going to be sort of a launch pad for this conversation with me. Uh, there is a powerful theme running through the work of all the folks up here, what's connecting them despite the differences in their focuses. And that's popular engagement and in participation, popular mobilization, popular sovereignty. You get my drift, they're all kind of popular. But the idea here is that they are dedicating a space and a place in their minds and their work for the people to partake in this important project, in this constitutional democracy, constitutional practice, and government design, which is really important to me in my own work as I think about it in my work as a con law scholar, an election law scholar, and in my book, the People's Constitution, which foregrounds these ideas. So I think you get it. This time in particular, with the election coming just two days ago, with the Supreme Court term having started, we thought that it would be a fun, fascinating, interesting, and timely exploration of these fundamental topics. So again, I'm Professor Wilfred Codrington. I co-direct the Florensheimer Center, and our panelists include Alicia Bannon, who is the director of the Judiciary Program and the founding editor-in-chief of the State Court Report at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. Uh, Corey Brett Schneider, who is a professor of political science at Brown University and a visiting professor of law at Fordham Law School. He's also the author of The Presidents and the People, Five Leaders Who Threatened Democracy and the Citizens Who Fought to Defend It, which is one of the books we're discussing. He has many other books. Uh, and Joshua Douglas. Joshua is the Ashland Inc. Spears Distinguished Research Professor of Law and University Research Professor at the University of Kentucky. Uh, he is the author of The Court Versus the Voters, the troubling story of how the Supreme Court has undermined the right to vote. Uh, and so I'm going to join them momentarily and start this dialogue with them. What we're going to do is start this conversation, I'll ask a few questions. Hopefully everybody will jump in. We'll leave open some time for question and answer, and then I'll, I'll sort of finalize it with a sort of final question to give them time for concluding thoughts. Thank you to all three of you. I'm going. So, oh. And so what I want to do is to start this conversation, this discussion, kind of with you, Josh and Corey, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of giving an overview of your work. And I kind of, I punctuated the point of popular sovereignty 
popular engagement. Maybe you'll highlight those to open it up. And Alicia, what I'm going to ask you to do is sort of respond and how these themes really fit in your work today. Maybe Josh, you'll start? Sure. Uh, well, first, thank you to Wilfred and to Cardozo and the Center for bringing me here. It's uh, it's a real thrill to uh, be in the city that never sleeps to talk about the issue that never sleeps of how to protect our democracy and uh, concerns over the right to vote. Uh, so as a scholar of voting rights and election law, I think it's really important uh, in my work to try to explain a lot of these issues to the general public. So, you know, you use the word popular and I'll start there in terms of my book and what my goals were. Um, you know, my, my colleagues who teach, you know, I don't know, property or something, uh, obviously that, that stuff matters to the general public too, but it's not in the public consciousness as much. Also that field basically never changes. Uh, whereas our field of election law changes almost on a daily basis. And so I've worked, uh, in, in two different books now to talk about issues with respect to, uh, voting rights with respect to election rules and election administration, and with this book, The Supreme Court. Uh, I'll give a brief uh, origin story of this book. So in 2019, I wrote my first popular press book called Vote for Us, How to Take Back Our Elections and Change the Future of Voting. And that book is basically a positive story, a good news story of voting rights. Now, I tell people I wrote a book that's good news about voting rights, and they assume it's just one page long, right? There's not enough to fill a whole book, but it actually is. It, it tells stories of people, I call them democracy champions, ev everyday individuals who are working to make our elections more inclusive, more democratic, and more convenient. And I had a lot of fun writing that book. I had the privilege of going all around the country and talking to people, talking to groups like the Legal Men Voters, Common Cause, and other similar organizations. And like any academic, when you have one idea and it works pretty well, you just want to do it again. Uh, and so that's kind of what I set out initially to do in this book. I thought, okay, let me write another good news book about what's possible for our democracy. I mean, ultimately, I'm actually an optimist. Um, you know this because I started a radio show and podcast this year through my local NPR station called Democracy Optimist. Uh, you can find it in all the podcast places. Um, and so I thought I'd write another kind of optimistic book. And I wrote up a, a proposal and I was calling it the Grand Election Compromise. Uh, uh, principles that we should all adhere to that are bipartisan, that could begin conversations about how we should think about voting legislation and how courts should consider voting rules. And so I wrote up this proposal and I sent it to a, a trusted advisor and uh, she read it and she said, you know, that that sounds great, but that's your conclusion. And I said, no, well, no, that's the book. She said, no, no, that's not the book. That's the conclusion. And I said, why? And she said, well, you know, if there's a problem with the voting rules, isn't the Supreme Court going to fix it? I, I think she was baiting me because uh, I was like, no, of course not. The Supreme Court is terrible on how it treats the right to vote. And she said, that's your book. She said, people need to understand why the court has treated the right to vote the way it does. And, and the other thing that was kind of the impetus was when I talked to people about, you know, how, what do you, how do you think the Supreme Court has been on voting rights? The general public, they'll say, well, it's really bad. The Roberts Court is really bad. And they'll point to cases like Bush v. Gore that entered the 2000 presidential election or Citizens United, the 2010 case about campaign finance. But as I show in the book, the foundation for those cases, the way in which the court has undermined and devalued the right to vote started from cases in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. So I try to tell this story, a narrative about, you know, when the court had been good in, fund in, in, in strongly protecting the individual right to vote in the 1960s and is uh, the ways devolved from those cases, the 70s, 80s, and 90s that took us to today. Uh, the other thing I'll say about the book and kind of the, the way it was organized, the way I wrote it, is that it's basically a book of stories. So I tell the behind the scenes stories of mm. the interesting people involved in these cases, the interesting lawyers. Um, and I uncovered a lot of kind of fascinating tidbits. There's even murder in the book. <laughs> I'm not joking. And I, I, I hope, I think I was successful. And the reason I know this is that uh, there's a website that actually put the book on the list of uh, the best summer reads about voting. I'm oh, sorry, the best beach reads about voting for 2024. <laughs> Literally, there was a list. It was like 
few, like three bucks and it was the best bee trees for 2024. And mine, mine was at the top. And, and actually I've seen someone reading the book on the beach. Okay. It was my wife, but still I saw someone reading the book on the beach. So, and she's not a lawyer. So I feel like uh, the goal of, you know, popularism in terms of telling a story to the general public about an issue that is so important with sneaking a little law in about why the Supreme Court and how the Supreme Court has failed to protect the right to vote is basically the unifying theme of what I set out to do. Great, and I want to come back to talk about the organization of your book even in more detail afterwards, because I think it's fascinating. Uh, Court, maybe you'll talk a little bit about your book? Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, the book is uh, about a warning, uh, the warning about a warning specifically about the danger of the United States presidency, but it also, like your book, has hope in it. And the hope is going to come from the idea of how we recover. And the argument is certainly it's never the Supreme Court that helps us to recover from the danger of the presidency, um, but it's citizens. So specifically, uh, let me say something about Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry, the revolutionary hero who people know from Give Me Liberty, Give Me Death, less understood is he opposes ratification of the Constitution, and he opposes it because he's worried specifically about the institution of the American presidency. His argument is, look, people like Hamilton, people like Madison have crafted this new Constitution with the assumption that these formal checks are going to work. The court, for instance, through judicial review will stop a dangerous president. Impeachment will stop a president who abuses power. But his argument is it all assumes a virtuous president. What if you get not only a bad president, but, and this is his language, but a criminal president? This is starting to sound familiar, I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, he's writing before ratification, warning against it. What if you get a criminal president? His language is that he won't stop um, to make one bold push for the American throne and won't hesitate, as this is quote, to crown himself a monarch. In other words, the presidency is so dangerous and the checks are so weak that what will happen is once you have not a president who's possessed a virtue, but a criminal president, they're going to realize their power is unchecked. That's going to make them bolder and bolder until they actually collapse the system. So, of course, the book is partly about the present and the present danger. Right. And it came out actually the day after the Supreme Court said in its immunity case that presidents are immune um, uh, when it comes at least to uh, criminal actions, uh, official criminal actions, presumptively immune. So it's gotten attention as a result of that. But it's really mostly, although it talks about January 6th at the end, uh, about history and about how that warning has come to life, specifically at five moments. It's written in these clusters of case studies of crisis and then recovery. So the first one is really about the battle over whether or not the presidency is beholden at all to the idea of the people or popular sovereignty. And it begins with the uh, the account of John Adams and the Sedition Act. And, you know, the Sedition Act by people like McCullough or other champions of Adams has often been underplayed. Um, the, the, you know, it's been seen as sort of a, a, a moment where America went wrong. But what I try to show, what I think I do show in the chapter, is that, first of all, it's been way understated how many prosecutions there were. There were 126. And they are aimed at a specific goal, which is not just the silencing of some critics, but the shutdown of an opposition party altogether. Um, in the midst of the prosecutions, uh, there's a publication of a Federalist plot to usurp the Electoral College by denying electoral votes to have a committee in Congress basically refuse to certify votes against the Federalist Party. Um, and when that's uncovered, it results in even more of a tampdown by, uh, uh, by, by, by Adams and his party. And so William Duane is among those who are prosecuted. You might think to yourself, well, wait a second, if, oh, let me say something too about the text of the Sedition Act, how it's crafted. It makes it a crime to criticize the president of the United States, but it is not a crime to criticize the vice president. Hmm. So as people, your reaction shows, right? You get what's going on here. This is a partisan piece of legislation. The vice president, of course, Thomas Jefferson, is a member of the opposition party. He, in uh, letters to Madison and elsewhere, worries that he might be prosecuted. Among the 126 uh, is a sitting congressman, Matthew Leon from Vermont. So why not go to the Supreme Court? Well, the court, and this is an overlap, clear overlap in our themes, uh, not only isn't going to give relief here, but Samuel Chase has lobbied for the acts and actually goes and sits on the trial of Thomas Cooper 
to make sure not only that he's convicted, which he makes sure of, but that he can't even raise the free speech claim. So how is it, and this is the first example of several, how is it that America recovers? How is it that we get away from this authoritarian idea of the Constitution to a more democratic one? One other point is, although part of what's motivating Adams is his own ego, he really rejects popular sovereignty in his political philosophies. One of a series of presidents who I profile who have an authoritarian, not a democratic idea of the Constitution. For him, following Montesquieu, the presidency is based in a kind of stability. And in fact, the right to free speech doesn't really create anything more than existed in the UK and the British common law. So criticizing the king is clearly not protected in the UK, there's sedition. And here he says, criticizing the president is not protected either. And it comes from this rejection really of the idea the president is somehow beholden to the people. So. The recovery comes instead from citizens, from these editors in particular, pushing back, not in court, but by using their own trials as a way of putting Adams on trial. And what they do is they use, they publicize their trials. Cooper, for instance, prints every day of his, uh, his trial to try to show that there really is an authoritarian shutdown of the opposition party. But I didn't want to write a book, and it's not a book just about people who spoke out and how great for them. It's really about how American democracy recovers, and more specifically, how an, a, a democratic idea of the American Constitution is recovered, even in these moments of crisis. So what they do, what's crucial, is that in the election of 1800, presidents don't campaign, of course, then, as they do now. Jefferson actually did give one speech. It doesn't go well, and he decides he's not going to do that anymore. So into the vacuum come the editors, and they use their own trials as an example of why it's so important to defeat Adams, to institute a, a regime of multi-party democracy. Now, of course, as we know and, and have talked about, Jefferson is, is you know, horrific on many topics, but on this issue, he really does commit to creating a legitimate opposition. And so when he says, we're all Federalists, we're all Republicans, the context of that is that he's going to ensure the Sedition Act expires, he pardons all of the editors, um, that were prosecuted. Uh, privately, he does seek the prosecution of his opponents, so he is, it is really this imperfect recovery, and that starts to show the pattern that we'll get in these other recoveries too. The more full recovery, I argue, comes with Madison, who even during the War of 1812, when he's tempted to shut down, when he's, he's, there are demands for him to shut down the opposition, this time the Federalist Party, given their anti-war positions, he refuses to do so. He invites, actually, uh, Hansen, a Federalist editor, to the White House and, and really institutes this idea of a multi-party democracy. Now, America is not a democracy at this point, it's a kind of proto-democracy, but part of the argument is it, it never would have gotten off the ground had these editors not fought back and used these recoveries. So the thesis of the book is certainly the court isn't the place that the Constitution, the democratic Constitution is recovered, but this system of citizens forming what I call democratic constitutional constituencies does work. They reclaim the Constitution by appealing to the public and by enlisting what, what I call recovery presidents over the course of time to recover the Constitution. So there isn't time to say all the details of the other ones, but I'll just say what they are. The next crisis comes at Buchanan, uh, his, his pretending to be neutral, but at the same time lobbying the Supreme Court uh, to decide the Dred Scott decision in the worst possible way, to deny Black Americans nationally any rights under the Constitution. And there's a debate in abolition. Should we abandon it like there is now? Should we abandon the Constitution? Dred Scott seems to reveal the logic of the evil Constitution. Garrison calls it a pact with the devil. And this time, the heroes of the book are led by Frederick Douglass and his wing of abolition. And my point is that really what he's able to do by teaching us to read we the people, popular sovereignty, as the central principle and to uh, see things like the corruption of blood uh, as standing for the idea that the Constitution is, a, in principle, an anti-slavery document. And by using the Declaration to frame the rest of the Constitution, he's teaching us how to read the Constitution, the citizen pushing back. Now, you might think Lincoln, okay, that's the recovery, that's the Jefferson moment, but the book talks about how Lincoln is very far from Douglas in the beginning. He believes that slavery is protected within the states. The Fugitive Slave Act should be enforced. Dred Scott's wrong, but should be abided by. So 
he has to convince Lincoln, and he's a fierce critic of Lincoln from abroad. He has to flee, actually, the United States. He's being hounded and prosecuted by Buchanan, and he does many of these speeches from the UK. And my argument is that Lincoln isn't just listening. He's worried, too, I think, that, that um, Douglas is going to sway the UK to, to sway England to enter the war on the side of the South. So there's a number of ways he's putting pressure on them. But over time, and especially in two meetings face to face, where Douglas talks about his sons who are um, uh, being discriminated against when it comes to pay, my argument is he brings Lincoln much closer to his own position. So in Gettysburg, when Lincoln talks about the Declaration framing the war, making it about the morality, the the idea that it's you know, government by, for, and of the people, uh, and that that's a reference to to slavery. That that's Douglas rather than something that Lincoln comes to. And it had been Douglas all along who had argued for this idea that the main argument against slavery is the declaration framing the Constitution. But it really is you know, not enough of a recovery uh, for Douglas. He calls him a white man's president when Lincoln dies. And in the Grant administration, in particular in the passage of the Enforcement Acts under the 15th Amendment, the, the Ku Klux Klan Act in particular, Douglas, you know, sort of his ideas are vindicated because he's been saying all along that there's really one principle. It's not just anti-slavery, one principle of the American constitution of a popular, based on popular sovereignty, and that's equal citizenship with an enforcement power. Uh, the book talks about Wilson. I went into the archives in Princeton. I was married in Woodrow Wilson's house. I, I thought that was a good thing. <laughs> if you read the book, you'll see that it is definitely not a good thing. Uh, the librarian at Princeton collected all, brilliantly collected all Wilson's um, students in constitutional law and in comparative, all the notebooks. And I think I've been inviting people to tell me I'm wrong, that I'm the first person to look at them. And what they show is a different kind of authoritarian constitution. You get one based on monarchy and Adams, an analogy with monarchy and um, Buchanan, the sort of fake neutrality while arguing for white supremacy. And in Wilson, you have this devotion to national uh, nationalism, national efficiency more specifically. And he sees one thing as in the way of national efficiency and this idea of the president in particular the sole person elected by all the people with a unique power to pursue national efficiency. What's the one thing in the way of, of uh, efficiency? It's what he calls friction. And what does friction turn out to be? It, it means uh, inter integration. And so when William Monroe Trotter and Ida B. Wells say in segregating the federal government, calling him out, you are spreading white supremacy, a system of second class citizenship. He says, well, you're creating friction. So the book tells the story of the recovery, not in terms of Brown, but in terms of the Civil Rights Committee, um, uh, Sadie Alexander in particular, the most important civil rights hero that's underappreciated, uh, the, the kind of role that she plays in outlining an agenda for recovery and executive, executive orders reversing the segregation of the federal government and the military, and most importantly, what becomes Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the use of financial incentives and disincentives to, to create public schools. And I try to say, Brown is important, but, but the work that Alexander and the committee does really has done the most to actually desegregate schools in America. Um, it talks about King's constitutional theory and realizing those ideals as well. The final story is really one that might be hopeful, might not, but I, I don't wanna start, start be naive in the book, and that's the Nixon story. And I interviewed Daniel Ellsberg shortly before he died. He really is the target of Nixon and his authoritarian idea of the presidency. Uh, which rests on the idea that we're in a civil war and so the president can do anything he wants. So when Nixon utters that famous line, when a president does it, it's not illegal. It's, uh, you know, it's not a, a spontaneous thing. He's, he's giving this defense of the authoritarian constitution. And I also tell the story of the grand jurors, including two who are still alive, who I spoke to, who really did try to stop Nixon. They voted, as Elaine Edlon, the legal secretary on the grand jury, puts it with two hands to indict Nixon because they saw the vastness of his crimes. And part of the argument is the attempt to kill Ellsberg on the Capitol steps, the um, uh, attempt to break into the Brookings Institution to get what we could hear Nixon say on the tapes on a thievery basis, or is more information about the Vietnam War implicating him and secret negotiations before he was president with the Viet Cong. Um, the, um, uh, attempt more famously to uh, shut down his psychiatry to get information from his psychiatrist, that all of those were the cases that were ongoing at the time that the pardon came. 
So why don't we know about them? It's because Leon Jaworski, who in some ways was a hero, but not exactly, uh, really stopped the grand jury from the indictment. And he makes a deal with them, especially, essentially. And I got most of this, a lot of it, uh, from two uh, of the Watergate uh, attorneys, including Philip Lacavar, the most senior person um, uh, working uh, uh, with Jaworski. And so the way they stopped the grand jury is essentially, Jaworski says, I'm not going to sign the indictment. You can't do it. If you indict, the president will surround the White House with troops. So I'll make you a deal. Hand over the information to Congress for impeachment. Um, uh, we'll go to court, get the remaining tapes. And once he steps down, we'll, we'll, we'll indict. And so what happens? Well, a lot of this does happen. The roadmap, as it's known, they pass over the information. There is pressure on Nixon to resign, which he does. They do get the tapes. Lacavara, with Jaworski at his side, argues U.S. versus Nixon. And um, the grand jury comes back. It's like, okay, great, it worked. Let, let's indict. And the what happens next, basically, is that uh, Jaworski goes to Haig, the then chief of staff for Ford, and we're not exactly sure what was said in that meeting, but Lacavara thinks, and I think what, what happened is that he, Ford was told, you better do it now. The grand jury is about to indict. And the book ends with this idea that we really never recovered from Watergate. We really never recovered from the criminal presidency of Nixon. We failed to put the checks in place that would have allowed the indictment of a sitting president, of a real legal check on the presidency. And of course, now that's just gotten more extreme with the court's immunity case. So there is no recovery. And the point of the book ending this way is to say to people, to all of us, like we better do something, that this is the moment that we really do need to use people like Ellsberg or the grand jurors, uh, Ethel Peoples, one of whom I spoke to, who was, you know, these were average citizens of Washington, DC. She, she was a janitorial worker uh, or Patricia Woodruff who had a simple idea, which is look, this person did it. The president did these crimes and should be indicted full stop. And so. The book ends with this sort of call to recover in the way that we did meaningfully recover from Adam's attack on free speech and from Buchanan's uh, demand to deny legal personhood to black Americans to recover the idea that really, for real, no person uh, is above the law. Yeah, and you, you say it ends with this sort of opening, right? And you're, coincidentally, your book came out the day before the uh, Supreme Court immunity decision. So that's just interesting, but it does show that there is more to be done here, kind of just pushes back to where Josh is, where the court kind of becomes this uh, antagonist. I want to ask you, Alicia, who's the antagonist in your work? Can you talk a bit about your work? Is it, is it the court? Is it the president? Is it other people? Maybe you can talk about that in the context of what you're doing now, your research, um, advocacy, and things like that. Um, sure thing. Um, so I, I work at the Brennan Center for Justice. I direct our judiciary program. And, um, you know, I think one of the themes that, um, you know, I think comes out really clearly in hearing about both of these fantastic books is that, you know, both in our current moment, as well as throughout at least much of American history, the Supreme Court has not been a reliable source of rights protection or of protecting um, democratic values. And I think that's a through line through a lot of the work that, that I'm engaged in at the Brennan Center as well. Um, you know, both we're doing work focused on um, reform of the US Supreme Court. So looking at the Supreme Court as not just a place where we might be litigating cases, but also as an institution of government itself that needs fixing. But then also looking at state courts and state constitutions as alternative sources of rights protection. And that's what I'm going to, I think, focus most of my um, my comments, at least for right now on. Um, you know, I think something and, you know, part of that work is we recently launched a new site, State Court Report, so statecourtreport.org, if, if anybody wants to look it up, which is a, a website dedicated to studying, having commentary, legal trends, highlighting scholarship, all focused on state courts and state constitutions. And you know why we did that and why we thought that was a really important um, site to create in this current moment was very much um, you know, a reaction to the US Supreme Court in a lot of key areas, um, you know, really sort of embracing what I would characterize as, as a approach of right to retrenchment. And so that includes in a number of democracy areas, areas like voting rights, um, 
partisan gerrymandering, other areas as well, reproductive rights, criminal, criminal justice issues, and a whole wide range of areas. The Supreme Court and our federal courts and federal constitution um, are, are often not now places where, um, where rights are being protected in, in a robust way. And so what we've been looking at at the Brennan Center is trying to focus um, more attention, more energy, more advocacy on looking at these state courts and state constitutions as, as these alternative sites. They're not a full substitute. And I want to, I can sometimes sound like a state court booster in a way that I don't want to overstate it. There's no substitute for having um, you know, a, a robust floor of federal rights. There are places where, you know, if the Supreme Court says the Second Amendment for does X, then even if a state court says, well, our state Second Amendment doesn't say X, you know, you still got to follow the federal law. So it's it's by no means a substitute or a full response to the, the moment we find ourselves in. But I think state courts and state constitutions are really intriguing and have been underappreciated and to some extent, at least in some arenas and in some states, really underutilized. Um, you know, ultimately, just if you think about the legal framework, when it comes to rights protection, the U.S. Constitution and federal law, it's a floor, not a ceiling. So state constitutions can and often do go farther than the U.S. Constitution when it comes to protecting rights. Um, and that can be provisions that are similar to provisions we find in the US Constitution, where courts may just find them to be more robust. So for example, we're starting to see that in the context of the Eighth Amendment, where um, a lot of states, you know, a lot of state constitutions, they may protect against cruel punishment or cruel or unusual punishment. And a lot of courts are saying, well, you know, that, that difference might mean something and might mean that our constitution should actually be more protective. In Massachusetts, for example, um, just recently, the, their state high court ruled that um, uh, prohibited life in prison without parole for um, anyone under the age of 21. Um, which goes much farther than what we've seen under, under federal law, for example, relying on their Eighth Amendment analog. And then state constitutions also just have a lot of stuff that the U.S. Constitution doesn't have. Um, and I'll say, I'll, do, I'll give a pitch for people that haven't read their state constitutions. Like, it's, there's a lot in there. It's very long. The New York's constitution, it's very long. There's a lot of stuff in there. And it's worth reading. You know, um, vir virtually every state, depends a little bit how you count it, um, has, a, has a right to vote. Um, I think Josh has, has written a lot about. Um, there are provisions um, in state, con near about half of all states have a state equal rights amendment. Um, so something we still don't have in the U.S. Constitution, a gender equality provision. There are provisions around environmental issues, um, provisions that address sort of more specific issues like gerrymandering. There's a whole host of stuff in state constitutions that, like I said, has, has been underappreciated and, and underutilized, I would say. Um, you know, we, we've been talking about um, popular, popular sovereignty, and so I wanted to just lift up a few ways in which I think about those issues when it comes to thinking about state courts and, and state constitutions in particular. I, I think, I mean, one thing just to say is that, um, you know, and there's, there's been a lot of really interesting scholarship about this, that if you read these, when, when you read your state constitution, you know, there, there is a lot, there, there's a, there's a popular sovereignty like element in state constitutions that's much clearer and stronger than we find in the US Constitution and that's everything from you know these explicit rights to votes to the fact that you know about half of all states have some form of direct democracy provisions within their state constitutions 17 states have an initiative process to amend their state constitutions so you don't need to go through a state legislature in order to um, to put to put an amendment on the ballot, so you know that um, the, those in those ways, state constitutions both kind of open um, open up avenues for popular participation in state state level democracy, and themselves are often closer to the people because of the role of initiative processes, and because in virtually. Um, every state, even if even if ultimately, um, e even if the legislature needs to be involved, ultimately constitutional amendments do go on the ballot. So there's an engagement with the public in a way that's very different um, with respect than when you compare with the U.S. Constitution, which, as Wilford knows what better than anyone, mm -hmm. is very hard to amend and is a whole fascinating story about how um, constitutional amendment processes work at the federal level. 
the the other piece I'll just um, mention, thinking about popular popular engagement and democracy in the states. Is, is looking at state courts, which is another really interesting, there's really interesting differences when you look at state courts as compared to federal courts. So for example, 38 states use elections as part of their system for choosing their state high court judges. And you know that, that has both, um, you know, that's a complex dynamic. It means that those courts are more directly tied, have a, have a closer democratic link um, to the public in ways that can be positive. So for example, you know, one thing that's been very interesting is you know, most states that use, um, use elections, they're statewide. Um, and so in some states where you've seen highly gerrymandered legislatures, judicial elections have been kind of another way to, um, for the public who may, who may be sort of excluded in some ways from the legislative process to have a kind of say in the, the, um, the government of their state. So, you know, there's there's opportunities like that where you can see, you know, the power of judicial elections. They create opportunities for organizing, engagement, accountability. There's also real concerns and downsides with judicial elections because, you know, ultimately courts are supposed to be, um, you know, judges aren't supposed to be politicians. Courts are supposed to be hearing cases, deciding cases based on what the law requires, not based on popular preferences there's an important anti-democratic element, right, that we want to see in courts. And there are, you know, there's concerns in terms of how judicial elections operate as well. They attract a lot of money in some states, a lot of special interest attention. And there's also evidence that pressures around um, that come from judicial elections can impact decision making in ways that might make us uncomfortable. So, for example, there's evidence that judges sentence more harshly in election years. You know, that's a that's a real crisis when you're thinking about, you know, the role that a court is supposed to play. So, you know, I don't know we're saying, is it, is it an optimistic story? Is it a pessimistic story? It's a complicated story. And I think but one thing that I think is is just important to think about is it's a really different story than when we think about the federal courts or when we think about the U.S. Constitution. And I think part of why I'm so excited about state court report and doing more of this work is that. Um, you know, there's there's a lot to understand and engage with that just hasn't gotten the attention that it deserves. And I think, um, you know, for 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 students and others in in the room, you know, I just think it's a place where there's a lot more thinking to do. There's a lot more to grapple with, and there's probably a lot of kind of institutional reform that we might want to see so that those states are, you know, fulfilling their promise and kind of appropriately balancing some of those tensions between, um, between you know, popular engagement and then um, the, the kind of counterbalance that we want to see from the courts. Yeah, and you mentioned that state constitutions have this stronger thrust of popular sovereignty. Miriam Seifert writes around yeah, this about Jessica the idea Williams. of democratic opportunity and sort of democracy principles. And you mentioned Josh's paper on the right to vote under state constitutions. I believe that was the first paper I read where I learned that there was no right to vote under the federal constitution. So thank you to that, which I cite obviously in some of my own work, but I wanna go back to you, Josh, maybe you can talk about that right to vote. And again, um, putting the Supreme Court in its position. Um, can you just talk about how the Supreme Court has degraded the right to vote over time? You start the story, I guess, in your first chapter, really in the 1950s and 60s, right? And Clearly, that's not where the story starts, but it's an important starting point for your story to talk about the rest of them. So maybe you can add a little color there. Sure. Um, before I do that, let me just follow up on what Alicia was talking about with respect to state constitutions, yeah. because I do think it's an important part of the story. Um, and, and maybe uh, my book should have come first before the article about state constitutions, because you know, why do we need to rely on state constitutions is because the U.S. Supreme Court is not adequately protecting uh, the right to vote. And, you know, that that first article, uh, the right to vote under state constitutions, came out 10 years ago. It was a 2014 article. And so it's been a decade now where there's been a lot of scholarship on how to think about state constitutions. Um and I actually have a new draft article out uh, called the, um, the Power of the Electorate Under State Constitutions, where I kind of take what Jessica Bullman Posen and Miriam Seifter have done um, and take it with their uh, democracy principle uh, of state constitutions idea and take it a step further and, and actually argue that if you read 
the state constitutions, which I've done multiple times now, um, it's almost as if the electorate is a separate branch of government. Um, and so I use an argument to uh, for courts to adopt separation of powers principles when a legislature is uh, passing a law that infringes on the electorate's ability to govern itself. Um, and so I think it's important to be thinking about these different ways. But so why is it important? Well, it gets back to kind of what my uh, advisor said, which is, you know, the, the Supreme Court's not going to save us with respect to our democracy as it currently stands. So uh, your initial, your, your question to open this round was about the 1950s and 60s. Well, you know, the Supreme Court was not um, great on voting rights for decades or centuries. Um, you know, famously said uh, in Minor versus Happerset that the uh, Equal Protection Clause does not uh, guarantee the right to vote to women. Uh, um, other cases in which uh, it denied the right to vote to um, minority individuals uh, uh, throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s. But then we did get to an inflection point in the 1960s, in which the court said in a series of cases, basically, of course, the Constitution includes protection for the right to vote. How could you have a constitutional democracy without that? Um, and so, no, the right to vote is not explicitly listed in the U.S. Constitution. There's nothing in there that says there is a right to vote. Um, it's discussed in the negative. No state shall deny the right to vote on the basis of race. That's the 15th Amendment. No state shall deny the right to vote on the basis of sex. The 19th Amendment on the inability to pay a poll tax is the 24th. On age over 18 is the 26th. Um, and maybe it's not surprising that the U.S. Constitution doesn't affirmatively grant the right to vote because the Constitution doesn't affirmatively grant many, many rights in general, right? First Amendment says Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of the speech. But of course, we all understand that when the Constitution says Congress shall make no law doing it, what does that mean? It means there is a right to free speech. <laughs> and that's essentially what the court said in cases starting with uh, the one person, one vote idea and redistricting um, and basically said, look, if we're going to have a democracy, uh, that requires people having a voice and that requires people having an equal voice. And so there's got to be a right to vote that's protected within the U.S. Constitution. Um, and what does it mean? That's the other question is, what does it mean to protect the right to vote if one exists? Uh, it means strong judicial scrutiny of state voting laws, right? So it, it's fine to say there is a right to vote, okay, but how does it, how do we give that teeth? Well, you know, the lawyers and the, and the law students in the room know that that means strict scrutiny usually, right? That means that a state has to be uh, put to the test to explain why is this voting rule important? Why does a state have to have this rule in the context of a voting law that might harm popular sovereignty, that might harm individuals' ability to participate in democracy, and that might harm the equal value of one's vote. And that's what the redistricting cases were all about, right, was this idea of equal value, of equal representation among people. And the court said, basically states, if you're going to have a voting rule, whether it's about how you're drawing your district lines, whether it's about whether voters have to pay a poll tax, whether it's about eligibility of people to vote in certain elections, like in New York with the school board election, uh, an important case called Kramer from the late 1960s. In all of those cases, the court is saying, we're not going to tr just trust the states to pass the voting rules without a very specific justification for why it needs to have that rule. And if the state's justification is not good enough, well, then the law is invalid because it violates that core ideal, that principle within the Constitution. Now, uh, you know, when we talk about constitutional interpretation, we can get to this debate of originalism versus living constitutionalism. But I think everyone, even the most conservative justice, would agree that you have to fill in the gap somewhere, that the, the Constitution does provide principles. Now, you know, how much you fill in the gaps or how far you want to take those, fine. But like, as, a, as I, I, I tell my students, um, uh, and we discuss in constitutional law, right, Congress shall make no law in bridging free speech. Obviously, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson thought what that meant in the age of TikTok, 
right? Now, of course they didn't, right? You couldn't imagine what TikTok or social media would mean. So we have to figure out, okay, what are the principles that that relies on? And the same goes for the right to vote. And so in these 1960s cases, the court said, well, the principle here is that robust participation by uh, individuals is a core component of democracy and equal value. And so if the state, you're passing a law that doesn't do that, well, you need a really good justification for it. But then things started to break down. And so chapter one of the book is about a case called, well, let's just do a quick test I like to do. And, and to be a little different than when I, I do this test before non-lawyer audiences, but I think it'll still work. How many people have heard of Bush v. Gore? The case. <laughs> How many have heard of Citizens United? How many have heard of Anderson versus Celebrezzi from 1983? Very few <laughs> compared to everyone else who raised their hand, right? So it still worked even with some lawyers in the room. And I call chapter one, which is about Anderson versus Celebrezzi, the beginning of the end. And we can get into more details if you want about why that is. But the basic gist here is that the court started saying to states, you know what? I'm not, we're not going to require as much justification for the voting rules we're passing. If the state wants to say, well, we think this is the best way to do it. Uh, election integrity is important, important to us, even if there's no actual concerns, like real evidence of, of integrity problems. Um, or if the court just says, look, this is how we want to run our elections. Uh, the, sorry, the state says, look, this is how we want to want to run our elections. The court basically is giving states a free pass. And and that started really in Anderson, maybe a little bit earlier with another case I talk about in the book on felon disenfranchisement from 1974, Richardson versus Ramirez. But I think Anderson is really the starting place where the court begins to pull back. And interestingly, Anderson actually was a win for voters in terms of the actual holding. But the test the court set out begins to elevate the role of states in running elections and stops requiring states to prov provide detailed reasons for the voting rules it has. And then later courts embellished upon that holding to now we're in a, a re regime today where the, it's, I call it undue deference to states. It's the states get full deference for how well they wanna run their voting rules without having to provide any evidence really whatsoever about what they're trying to achieve on the other hand, the voters have to provide a ton of real actual evidence to even make the case that a law is going to harm them. So we've got things totally backwards with respect to the 60s when the court elevated the importance of voters and said, states, you're put to the test and show us real evidence of what you're trying to achieve versus now voters, you got to show a ton of evidence to make your case that the law is burdening the electorate and states really don't have to say any, do anything besides just say, this is what we want to do and the court is trusting the states. Uh, and the last thing I'll ask uh, you all to think about is, why is this backwards? Well, I don't know about you, but state politicians are the last people I would trust to craft voting rules because what's their number one goal to win re-election? And what better way to do it than to pass laws to make it easier for their supporters to vote and harder for their opponent's supporters to have fair representation. So uh, this idea that, well, trust the state legislatures and if you don't like the rules, just vote the bums out. Well, what happens when the bums are the ones making the rules and make it harder to vote them out? That's why we need a court that's going to scrutinize these things much more robustly than it's doing. I thought maybe that was a trick question. Maybe the answer was going to be to protect the people's fundamental rights. You'd hope that's what uh, state politicians, you know, the most virtuous, you'd hope that's what they want to do. But that's just, you know, obviously not the reality. And I don't think we could expect them necessarily to do it without any actual checks on them, because, of course, the whole nature of since the founding of politicians, as Corey was saying in some of uh, uh, the stories he was telling, was this idea of um, of self-interestedness. And so that's why the court should be the the check. I mean, uh, you know, I love this, the, the story Corey's telling about, you know, the, the, the people essentially have to do it. But wouldn't it be a better system <laughs> if the court did do it and it, it did once it, it showed us that it could once before. And yet now it's certainly not doing so. Um, and, and speaking of those checks and the people, Corey, maybe you can discuss the idea of the constitutional constituency a little bit um, and who you sought to profile in your book. And one thing that I'm really interested in is that these constitutional constituencies are often they have the same goal, um, but they don't always work in unison. And so one of the rivalries you highlight, for example, is King versus Thurgood Marshall. We think about them as both 
great leaders and icons in the civil rights movement. And they were, and they were both working towards something, but they had very different approaches to this. And so maybe you can talk about why you chose to highlight certain constituency, what a constituency is first, why you chose to highlight certain ones, and maybe antagonism or rivalries within those constituencies as they seek to sort of right side what's going on in the presidency. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, so the idea partly in the book is that, you know, throughout American history, except for a couple of brief moments, the Supreme Court has almost always made things worse when it comes to crises of democracy. You see that in the Sedition Act with Samuel Chase. Uh, as I said, certainly in Dred Scott, the court is really <laughs> stoking with Buchanan, the crisis of democracy. One huge counter argument you might think is, well, what about Brown? Isn't that the case that saved America from Plessy? And certainly I don't want to disparage Brown in any way. It's an important case, certainly in terms of the symbol and in terms of the um, legal decision to re refer reverse Plessy formally. Um, but I want to go earlier and say there was this moment during Truman where a kind of a popular movement, a constituency, um, uh, pushed a president to, to recover. So the way these constituencies begin in, in all of the phases is through resistance. And so in the Wilson story, he's confronted in real time by Sadie Alley, by, sorry, by um, Ida B. Wells and by William Monroe Trotter, an activist and editor out of Boston. But uh, Trotter dies despondent, thinking that all is lost, that basically Wilson's nationalization of segregation is going to be the, the principle that governs America. And over time, it, the moment of recovery that I point to is when the NAACP and Walter White go to Truman and start to, you know, Truman is the least likely recovery president at that moment because he's chosen to replace Wallace because he uses the N-word and he's meant to uh, reassure Southern segregationists that, you know, this is their person and, and FDR chooses him precisely because of his, his supposedly pro-segregation uh, white supremacist credentials. So when Walter White leads this delegation to go and s try to persuade him to shift course, to reverse course from, from uh, the Wilson legacy, it's unlikely to work. And yet they're completely surprised. And they do it through storytelling, not through legalistic arguments. And the stories that they tell, them, tell him are of black soldiers returning home from the war and being beaten up and in some cases killed. And he's genuinely moved the way that Walter White tells it. And they're ready because he says, well, what can I do? And they suggest not litigation, but a committee. And the committee is going to study the issue. And they put onto the committee these kind of ringers who are going to try to use this committee that's filled with lots of corporate people to, to, to bring this citizen voice, the sort of ultimate constitutional constituency of the now developed civil rights movement to persuade the president to 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 change course. Now, one way they do it, it's not that lawyers aren't involved and that these arguments aren't legalistic. In fact, Sadie Alexander is a lawyer and she brings in Thurgood Marshall to talk about many of these ideas and to educate the committee about why this matters. It's also she uses personal sort of persuasion. One of the key moments in the book is she doesn't have the votes on the incentives idea, what becomes Title VI. Uh, she's one vote short. In fact, they vote and print the report without anything to do with Title VI. It's just seen as too radical. She does get reversal of the segregation of the federal government and, and the commitment of the federal government to try to reverse um, uh, Plessy. But on that one is issue, the way she does it, is she persuades Eleanor Roosevelt to persuade her son, FDR Jr., to switch his vote, which she does. And so Marshall is there, uh, you know, and he is playing a role of citizen, but over time, the real inheritors, the way that I tell the story of that committee and of the agenda, inheritor is, is Martin Luther King. And he and Marshall, it's not widely understood, although you know people who study this know it, but I try to tell it in detail. They just have completely different approaches because Marshall really thinks it's litigation. And King is saying, no, it's not litigation. It's basically taking the ideas of the committee, including this incentives idea, and pushing for it through popular pressure on jo Johnson that, that will then result in legislation. 
So that that's kind of the tension, like, should we do it through court or should we do it here? And part of what political science and social science has shown is that it really is the legislation, not Brown, not the litigation that results in empirically in, in most desegregation of schools. So that's that's the idea that it's, you know, it's not through litigation that democracy is restored. It's through these popular movements galvanized by heroes. And it is individual agents that do it who are able to do two things. One is to give an idea of the Constitution and then put pressure on these recovery presidents to act. Um, you know, one thing that struck me in the book is that the, the kind of most sophisticated legal thinkers, the legal theorists, are often the authoritarians. So Adams, premier constitutional thinker of his time, Buchanan, certainly a lawyer, Andrew Johnson, who I haven't talked about, but you know, it's part of the story of trying to stop the re recovery of reconstruction lawyer. Nixon, of course, a lawyer, and Wilson, the premier constitutional thinker of his time. And the pushback comes in almost all cases from common sense, from the newspaper editors who sort of see their own rights violated from um, the Douglas, who's not formally trained, but it, you know s s has seen his rights violated in the most real sense as a formerly enslaved person, um, William Monroe Trotter and Ida B. Wells, you know, they're, and they're, it's not also that they're not, they are giving the principles and sophisticated arguments, but it's done in a kind of common sense, elegant, democratic way, as opposed to these highfalutin, more authoritarian theories. So I, that's kind of part of the argument of the book. And you know, Marshall is both. He's both part of the constituency because he sees his role with Alexander. They're strategizing. How do we convince this essentially corporate committee to endorse these radical proposals? And so he with her, they engage in a colloquy, for instance, in front of everyone where they're kind of doing this back and forth. She's pretending basically to cross-examine him and he's, you know, buckling under pressure. And they're they're using a lot of you know persuasion and performance. But then when it comes to the ultimate, I mean, you know, King, if, if for good reason, is the most known order in American history. And part of the story I tell is how he comes to be so great is through realizing the language of the Constitution embraced in a kind of popular form that he's originally this natural law theorist. He's not doing well in public debates. And he's convinced in a dialogue, actually, with a student from a college to start talking about the principles of the founding, the principles of the Constitution. And Marshall hates it. He's like, he doesn't like resistance and civil disobedience. He doesn't like the whole idea of bringing the law to the people. It's something that should be done in court. So he's both a hero in the book because of his work with Sadie Alexander, less understood, and you know, very misguided in his criticisms of King. He criticizes him publicly. He, in the NAACP, tries to undermine him. And um, so, yeah, that's not, I guess, a well-understood story. But it brings out a lot of the idea of the book that the thing that works is is the public movement, not not litigation is important, but historically, at least the the it's been these. And, and I'll say too, like just a you know one of the most amazing things in the book is during COVID, getting a call from um, uh, Ethel Peoples, who was one of the jurors. There are two jurors alive. Um, I asked her, you know, she's uh, the jury really represents Washington D.C. It's um, and and she's somebody who was a janitorial worker. And I asked her, you know, do people know what you did? You shouldn't vote it to indict the president. Almost stop. And she's like, they know I was involved in something to do with the president and some important case, but no, nobody had. And then when I asked her, like, well, what, like, what gave you the courage or the ability to do this? I mean, that they came so close to doing it. And she said you know, it's common sense. Like if somebody does a crime, they should be punished. He's no different than us. We saw all the evidence. And so that sort of common sense thinking, you know, I teach, you know, undergrad constitutional law and law law students at Fordham. And there's an emphasis, of course, like, especially with the law students on cases and judges. And so part of what I'm trying to say in the book is the origin story of the, the democratic constitution really doesn't come from public officials or from courts or from lawyers it comes from from citizens and you really see that in the in the king versus marshall I yeah think. I, th I think that's really great to highlight and it also just shows how we as lawyers the legal profession generally kind of give our create the self-important mm -hmm. right and sometimes you need to step back and say hey the profession is about being an agent mm. right and so there are other ideas that we are meant to represent 
sort of advanced that are not just the ones derived in the law schools or in the courtrooms, but there's something out there driving them. And I think that was highlighted very nicely in that in that sort of tension there. Um, Alicia, I, I want to come back to you and sort of pick up. So Corey was describing some constitutional constituencies from these different periods, particularly that one during the um, uh, in, in opposition to uh, Wilson um, and everything going on during that time. I'd love to know about some constitutional constituencies today that maybe you're dealing with. Um, one that I'm thinking about, and so there's two sort of um, things. One, I have a specific question or a specific idea I'd love for you to talk about a bit more. But then just generally going back to my time at the Brennan Center, they have a tradition of doing these annual awards dinners. And they always spotlight individuals or some sort of organization or entity that is doing the work. And it kind of reminds me of this constituency, this idea of a constitutional constituency, because we are, or the Brennan Center was sort of highlighting the work that they did to right side democracy at difficult times. And so that makes me think about it. But then we go today, uh, and I'm sure Josh will have something to add about this too, but look in Ohio. Right. And I'm thinking the ultimate sort of I don't like the big person theory of history, but the ultimate big person theory there is the former Republican Supreme Court justice who is now leading a constitutional constituency within the state. Maybe you can flush that out a little bit um, with some details. Absolutely. Um, it's a it's a fascinating, complicated story, and I think really um, highlights some of what you were saying, some of what Corey was saying about the the limits of litigation, and you know the ways in which you know litigation can sometimes only get you so far, or maybe be one tool in a much broader arsenal when you're thinking about um, constitutional engagement and constitutional change. And uh, so the story in Ohio is a complicated one. Um, I'll, I'll I'll maybe start from where I first got involved. So uh, I was I worked um, uh, so the Brennan Center. Um, was actually involved in state constitutional litigation um, in front of the Ohio Supreme Court a few years ago. Um, so the, the people of Ohio had passed a constitutional amendment um, that uh, put serious limits on the on partisan gerrymandering, um, required a proportionality, you know, very, very kind of robust um, standards around partisan gerrymandering. So we thought. So, well, the standards were strong, the foreshadowing, um, and they the, and then um, they created, at least for drawing the legislative maps, um, a commission, but not an independent redistricting commission, a commission that was appointed by, um, so it included appointees from the legislature and then the governor and other um, political officials, officials. So it was a partisan commission and given the current composition of the, the state dominated, um, dominated by Republicans. And um, you know what we saw. Um, so we were representing um, the Ohio Organizing Collaborative, as well as a number of other civil rights, environmental groups, and voters um, in the state. Um, uh, basically, what we saw in the redistricting process was this very partisan redistricting commission drew maps that basically completely ignored all of these, you know, very clear standards and restrictions with respect to partisan gerrymandering and drew and. Um, wrote, you know, drew maps that created a, a Republican supermajority in the state. And, um, you know, very much not reflective. If you look at, you know, we, we had lots of political scientists, there was lots of analyses. And this was this was a pretty extreme partisan gerrymander, one of the most extreme that we'd seen. And um, we brought them to court. And um, we brought an original action. There were a few few lawsuits brought at the same time um, in front of the Ohio Supreme Court, um, saying this look at the language in the state constitution, look at all of this expert evidence. Um, this is this is violates the state constitution and the court in a four to three um, opinion written by Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor, who's a Republican um, uh, on the on the state Supreme Court said, yep, this is a partisan gerrymander, struck down the map and sent it back to the commission, draw a new map. Now, one problem with the state constitutional language was that um, that was basically the extent of the court's um, remedial powers. So the commission, the court lacked the ability to ultimately redraw the map. Ultimately, the power was with the commission to, um, to redraw this map. So they sent the map back to the commission, said, no go, you've got to draw, you've got to draw a map that, that meets the state constitutional requirements. And then they drew another partisan gerrymander. 
um, went back to court, said this plainly violates your opinion. Court said, yep, and sent it back again. Now, I have to say as a litigator, you know, it was a little brazen, but you sort of, you know, they're testing the boundaries. They had a theory of how this map differed from the other map. And, you know, lawyers were lawyers. So we were like, okay, we go back again. And they just do it again. And we did a merry-go-round. At one point, the, um, the commission repassed a map that had been struck down, the exact same map that had been struck down by the state Supreme Court is unconstitutional and just like sent it back again. And the dynamics here, there were two things going on. Um, you know, one, there, there was an election coming. So there needed to ultimately be a map. And so um, ultimately what happened was that a federal lawsuit was filed because, you know, one person, one vote, like you, you know, this map that you couldn't just vote with the old map. Um, there needed to be a map in place. Um, it was a it was not a great panel. And ultimately, the um, the uh, the federal court ordered one of the gerrymandered maps to be used in the election. So they ran down the clock in that dimension. And then they also ran down the clock in that Chief Justice O'Connor, who was the the swing vote in this four to three ruling, was um, reaching a mandatory retirement age. So she was going to be leaving the court. And um, you know, so so the court's composition was predictably going to be um, was going to be changing, and so uh, so what we saw was then um, the election was was run under a gerrymandered map. We had a new Ohio Supreme Court, new majority. They didn't overrule the um, prior um, prior decisions, but they essentially kind of threw out the case and said, if you want to. Um, if you want to litigate in this more, you're going to have to come back and start anew. Um, so that's kind of, that's the bad news story. And there's other, there's other aspects. There was an impeachment, there's an impeachment campaign against Chief Justice O'Connor. There was a whole lot of, you know, the political temperature got pretty high in the state. Um, you know, and I, I think it's interesting there too, because, you know, the court didn't use all of the um, powers it could have with respect to contempt and others. And I, I wonder about the political climate in the state and how that might have impacted how aggressive the court was in interacting with the commission. So that's the bad news story. And that's some of the lit limits of litigation. But then there's also a really interesting um, other component of this story, which is that when Chief Justice O'Connor stepped down, she went on to now be leading a campaign to amend the um, Ohio Constitution. So Ohio is one of the 17 states that has an initiative process um, to amend its constitution. So you don't have to go through that gerrymandered legislature. And there's a measure that's on the ballot, um, going to be on the ballot this fall, um, that would create an independent um, redistricting commission. So addressing some of the um, dynamics that we saw with this partisan commission. So this would one would be, um, you know, much much more independent and had a lot of other safeguards. Kind of learning from the experiences of the um, of the of, of the past um, the past experiences. Now the court is still important. Um, I mean, one way that we're already seeing the, the continued importance of this court is there's been litigation over the language. How is this amendment going to be described to voters? And um, the language that's being put forth by a partisan controlled ballot board um, basically describes this as require describes this constitutional amendment as one that's going to require gerrymandering, which is, I mean, is just it's a pretty laughable description of the ballot language. But the state Supreme Court, with this new majority, um, is allowing that language to go forward. So, you know, I think it's, um, you know, it remains to be seen, like there's been a huge amount of popular mobilization around this constitutional amendment. I do think it's something where the litigation was important. Like, I think mm -hmm. the litigation was part of the organizing tool that people used, like being able to tell this story of how courts were failing was part of what was able to get people mobilized to do something. Um, and so I think it's it's complex. In, I think it's a complex story when you think about the role that the court ultimately um, played played in this. But you know, it's a place where now we're seeing um, we're going to be seeing direct democracy in action. Um, there was an effort last year to make it harder to amend Ohio's constitution. They tried to increase the the number, um, the percentage of votes that would need be required to amend the constitution. And the voters said, "Nope, we want to keep it at fifty percent." 
And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll see soon whether or not, um, whether or not the, the ballot initiative is successful, but it's something where the former chief justice has been involved and many of the groups that were involved in litigating some of these cases have been, um, you know, are, are back in a different capacity. And then there's just been sort of broad public organizing um, and public engagement on the issue. And I feel I can give a thousand shout outs to Miriam and Jessica, but they wrote an amazing article, The Right to Amend State Constitutions. So it talks about some of these issues, about the ways that states are making it more complicated to amend their constitutions, including with rivaling back, uh, ballot language and things, or trying to increase the threshold um, to amend constitutions, including in Ohio. Josh, I want to pick up with there with you, and maybe I did this in the wrong order, but one of the <laughs> cases you talk about is Rucho. And so, um, and, you know, um, I think it's, maybe you can contextualize the risk, what, tell, talk about what went on in Rucho and contextualize the response, maybe in the States, given the work that you think about in the States um, in response to that. And I, I do want to push you just on one point, actually, um, before you get to all of that, in the beginning of your book, you do write the Supreme Court hasn't advertised its move towards deference to the states with its accompanying hard um, uh, accompanying hard voters. It rules in incremental ways. Incremental? I, I, I read that and I was like, oh, that's that's a that's a nice gloss. But would you I guess in the light of the last three years, would you say that that's incremental? Well, that, this, that's the important point, actually, is that w what I'm talking about is um, what I began earlier by saying when I talk to people about, you know, what do you think of the Supreme Court and voting rights? And they say, oh, it's Citizens United that's bad. It's Bush v. Gore that's bad. Uh, the court has certainly been much more aggressive in the past couple of years. But even in doing so, the court can say, well, we're relying on precedent, right? So, uh you know, it's the Anderson case from 1983. It's the Burdick case from 1992. It's the Crawford case on voter ID from 2008. None of those were radical departures, at least explicitly, from the regime of the 1960s when the court used strict scrutiny, when the court put states to the test. And so the incremental nature here is really over the decades of the 70s, 80s, and 90s that got to a point where now... The court's uh, you know, jurisprudence is this deference to states. But the way it got there, I think, is was not signaled. It was not, you know, hey, everyone, we used to really elevate the right to vote, and now we're not doing so. Now we're right, elevating the right of state legislatures. Um, you know, if we want to look at the small slice of the past five years, you could argue that the court has been much more aggressive in overturning precedents. But even there the court tries to create a veneer of um, institutional legitimacy. And so take, well, I guess it's not three years, but take Shelby County from 2013, where the court, uh, and that's the case that essentially gutted the protections of the Voting Rights Act of Section 5. But technically what the court did was it didn't rule on Section 5, which is this uh, preclearance mechanism that requires certain states with a history of discrimination to get free approval on their voting laws, the court said, well, we're overturning Section 4B, which was the formula that Congress had used to determine which states were in, under the covered jurisdictions. The other thing the court did was it said, look, we're not making a, ra a radical decision here because we're just re relying on what we said four years ago. So there's this case that no one paid attention to called Northwest Austin or Namudno from 2009, in which the court refused to strike down the uh, protections of the Voting Rights Act and did a really tortured statutory analysis to, you know, if you know, any sort of people who think about how statutes should be read uh, would say the court was totally crazy because uh, there's a, a definition, the statute of a term, and the court said, well, we're going to ignore the statutory definition and use our own di dictionary definition instead. And it did so to avoid the constitutional question. But then four years later in, in, uh, in the Shelby County case, the court could say, well, see, we told you, and we're just relying on precedent. So I do think still the court is not explicitly now, of course, in reproductive rights, the court literally says we're overturning Roe v. Wade, um, right? And uh, was it Loper Bright? The court literally says we're overturning Chevron. So yes, there are cases now where the court has gotten bolder 
But in the voting rights area, the court is still trying to pretend <laughs> that it is being more incremental or relying on precedent. And if you look at the evolution of those cases no one's heard of, Anderson, Burdick, Crawford, Anderson, the 5-4 decision in which the voters won, the, the people who brought the lawsuit, this is about John Anderson's run for president uh, in 1980 as an independent. And the court ultimately said that the state law was un unconstitutional because it made it harder for the people, the voters who wanted to vote for Anderson to cast the ballot that was effective for them. And yet the court said, but we do look at what the state's justification is and a little bit of a, uh, we in a in a way that we balance we balance the interests of the voters with the interests of the state and then in Burdick and actually this I think I want to take a quick aside to say that the the Burdick case from 1992 is a great example of of what Alicia and Corey were talking about this was a a random guy named Alan Burdick who went to his polling place in Hawaii one day and uh, tried to do a write in vote and uh, the he said I, I don't like any of the candidates on the ballot he actually said to the poll worker. Uh, I, I tracked him down. Those of you who know this case, it's fascinating to actually go find Alan Burdick and interview him. He's still in Hawaii. He got on our Zoom wearing a Hawaiian t-shirt, a Hawaiian shirt, uh, you know, true to form. Uh, and he's still to this day very angry about the decision. But this wasn't cause litigation. This was just some dude. And uh, he goes to the polling place and he says, I don't want to vote for any of the candidates listed on the ballot. Uh, and the poll worker said, what? he said, I want to write in a candidate. And the poll worker said, well, the machine won't allow that. And he said to me, you know, I didn't know if he meant the uh, the polling machine <laughs> or the political <laughs> machine that controlled Hawaii elections wouldn't allow right in voting. Um, and ultimately, he takes this case all the way to the Supreme Court. And what does the court do in that case? Well, not only does he lose, and maybe that's not a big deal because, like, how many of us, you know, want to write in a candidate? And uh, by the way, the case is known as the Donald Duck case. It's the only time in Supreme Court history Donald Duck's been in a Supreme Court opinion. I looked it up. Uh. Um, and... Uh, and it's because of an exchange at the oral argument where his lawyers, uh, his the justice said to his lawyer, you know, so your client wants to vote for Donald Duck. And his lawyer was like, yeah, well, actually, Alan's really pissed about that answer. He's like, no, I wouldn't vote for Donald Duck. That's not, you know, it, it makes a mockery of what I'm trying to do. Um, but in any event, so I'm like, is it a big deal that he lost? Probably not. But what the court did was we said, you know, we balance the interests of the state with any harm on the voter. And we actually, we kind of put a thumb on the scale of the state. That was incremental as it went from Anderson to Burdick and then it continued through Crawford. So I, I do think that the statement is accurate because of the court tries to pretend it's being legitimate in relying on precedent and not explicitly saying, hey, everyone, we're undervaluing the right to vote. We get to Rucho, uh, which is the other part of your question about partisan gerrymandering. Um, I start the chapter just to highlight that it's a book of stories. I start the chapter with, uh, 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 with two people that, that mo many of us know, um, Nick Stephanopoulos and Ruth Greenwood, who are uh, a law professor and, and litigator, uh, and a law professor and litigator both, um, and uh, their wedding cake, which was a gerrymandered. Uh, they, they fell in <laughs> love over gerrymandering their cake. It was actually a gerrymandered district, um, which is pretty funny. Um, the most geeky cake that you can think of for a wedding. Um, but, you know, what happens there? Well, the court for years had said uh, partisan gerrymandering might be unconstitutional or even is, but we need a standard. We need a test to determine because anytime a, a legislature does something, it's political in nature, right? They're politicians. So the, the question is, when has a map gone too far? When is it so far that judges can decide this one's an outlier? And for years, because, you know, in, in a 2004 case, the court basically said, well, four of them said, this isn't something that judges should decide. Four of them said, sure it is. And here are all these tests that you could use. They're very clear mathematical formulas. And, and then Justice Kennedy in the middle was like, I don't know, I'm not smart enough. Someone else go figure this out. Uh, he didn't say he's not smart enough, but he did say, you know, someone else go figure this out. Uh, and so for years, political scientists and law professors were trying to come up with a formula that would satisfy Justice Kennedy. Of course, with a change in the composition, the court in Rucho says, uh, you know what, we're going to throw up our hands and, and on a 5-4 decision said, uh, there is something as, as, as such as known as constitutional partisan gerrymandering. Actually, mm -hmm. partisan gerrymandering is constitutional, the court says, because it's the politicians doing it. And if you don't like it, vote the bums out, right? We talked about before. Um, and so what is the theme here? And it actually is a through line of all of the cases I talk about in the book. Trust the legislature, right? This undue deference to 
the legislature. So you might say Rucho is a radical decision, although actually the court had signaled for years that it was uncomfortable coming up with a test to ferret out the worst abuses in partisan gerrymandering, and then the court put the nail in the coffin in that case. So it really is up to state courts uh, to police this area because the Supreme Court has said, well, we trust the legislature. Um, I want I want to turn a little bit, and I'll, then I'll see if we have questions in the audience. But I want to figure out, um, talk about something about the role of popular culture. We were talking about popular sovereignty and popular engagement, but popular culture, yeah, and what happened. So, Corey, in your book, you highlight, and probably my favorite chapter, I guess, about um, about Wilson, uh, how he screened the birth of a nation in mm. the White House. Right, this is. A, a robustly racist uh, view of what was going on in the United States, uh, what the, it was a revisionist history of sort of the whole Civil War. Um, basically, it had white people dressed up in blackface, chasing women, women jumping off of cliffs, white women, of course. Uh, there was lots of things going on. And, and Wilson screens this as uh, the sitting president in the White House. Now, how he got there, that's a different question, but um, you know, it seemed to align with his views. On the other end of this, we see the sort of role of media in highlighting what was going on during the civil rights era, right? The the brutality against protesters just trying mm. to vote, the the hosing of protesters trying to march for the civil rights and sicking dogs on them. So we see the sort of use of media and popular culture on both those ends. Josh, you talk about uh, Bush v. Gore and how, um, in some senses, even Hollywood wouldn't take that script, right? <laughs> because there were just so many outrageous things going on. Each part itself was kind of equally unbelievable. And they bring together um, the story where we're down, you know, five weeks after the election and 500 some odd votes separating the United States from two different men leading it. And by the way, Hollywood tried actually after Bush v. Gore, there's this terrible movie starring Kevin Costner called, <laughs> I forget what it's called, One Vote or Recount. I know, I don't recount, I think it's where funny. the presidential election comes down to Kevin Costner living in Colorado. It's just, it's like <laughs> but, totally ridiculous, right? But they tried to mimic Bush v. Gore. It doesn't work, right? But yeah, and, it, doesn't, and, it doesn't work. And on the other hand, Citizens United was about a Film, right? Mm -hmm. It was a film against Hillary and sort of whether this was appropriate electioneering in the lead up to the election, right? And Alicia, I, I, where I want to, I guess, have you jump in here too, is to, um, well, you guys talk about that sort of how it sort of frames your story, but Alicia, how um, an organization like the Brennan Center, uh, a think tank, an advocacy organization, a sort of legal nonprofit thinks about the use of media and popular culture and how it can leverage that to remain authentic to the people, sort of being their driving force behind their work. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll start with you, Corey, since sure. I started with you. Yeah, I mean, part of you know the claim about Wilson is certainly not that he's the first white supremacist president. We talked about that with Buchanan and Andrew Johnson. But what's distinctive about him is, I say he's the first white nationalist president. And part of it is the spread of white supremacist apartheid policies through the segregation of the federal government, the thing that Trotter and Wells are confronting him about. And that leads them really in the White House to battle it out between his defense of Plessy saying, if you see second class citizenship in this, you're imposing it. He's really echoing the language of Plessy. And they push back and they really say decades before Brown and before the committee, uh, separate is inherently unequal. It's not this is about subordination and second class citizenship. And he says, well, you're creating friction, <laughs> you know, using this language. So he's really, you know, devoted to this idea, both of not just white supremacy, but that that it should be spread and throughout throughout the federal government to not because of this idea of nationalism and efficiency. So part of it is not just policy, but cultural and the cultural creation of the most important mode that presidents have for nationalizing their policies and voice. And that's the bully pulpit. That's a term that's associated with Roosevelt. And he actually opens the press office, uh, bully meaning, sorry, meaning, um, you know, neato or nifty, not, not meaning like with a stick, but Wilson really uses it in the other way. He really uh, brings in many of his Princeton students. They occupy the 
press office and he's trying to nationalize a message. Now, the cultural part of this is not just that he shows birth of a nation in the White House, but that he's really endorsing it and spreading it. And the surprising thing, I think what's new and what I'm saying too, that, that part is well known, but is that, you know, he, not by coincidence, he spreads his ideas uh, not through lecture, just through lectures and throughout the country and as a professor, but he wrote a textbook. And the textbook is one way that he made money. It's a, something that was sold like door to door. And in it are many of the scenes that look almost identical to Birth of a Nation. And what he ta talks about the Klan in those scenes, it's similar to the argument, the argument of Birth of a Nation, which is that this is not, you know, the law, but it's necessary. You know, it's a, a short term form of violence in order to create the kind of stability that you need in the nation. Now, that would seem like a coincidence, except that he studies at Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins, um, uh, with uh, the creator of something called the Teutonic germ theory. And his classmate and friend is Thomas Dixon, who wrote The Klansman. And The Klansman is the basis of Birth of a Nation. So when you see the parallels, you know, this this isn't just a coincidence. That's part of what I'm trying to say. I'm careful about, you know, I don't have like Dixon saying I got this from Wilson, but the, they're certainly sympathetic ideas and they're sharing ideas. And we know that they didn't just know each other, but that they were friends at Hopkins. So part of it is this cultural story of not just the segregation of the national government, but that this, the nationalism comes through the creation of the bully pulpit and cultural forces like like film, which is the most important moment. Um, the other thing that, you know, I guess you know, it's because it's reported through media is he, in the midst of Red Summer, is giving these speeches that are widely reported, which are stoking violence. He's he has a, a, a phrase that he didn't create, but that he certainly uses a lot, which is about the disloyalty of hyphenated Americans. And He's really using this phrase and and members of the nascent civil rights movement are calling him out for using this phrase to not just refer to Italian Americans or Irish Americans, but black Americans, suggesting that the pro protests against what he's doing are not just disloyal, but that they really are showing sympathies to uh, the revolu emerging revolution in, in, in Russia. So he's got a lot of elements of nationalization, the, the policy of, of segregation, the show, not just showing of the film, the, the belief in the film and its reflection of his deeper ideas. And then the, in the midst of what is some of the worst racial violence in the country's history, rather than quelling it, you know, it, 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 and it, it is in some ways reminiscent of there are good people on both sides in the midst of the Charlottesville Right. But in some ways, it's even worse because he's he's actively stoking it, I think. And then he in the midst of one of the worst um, um, uh, incidents of of uh, racial violence, uh, he refuses to call out even in Washington, D.C., any to do anything to call out the military or anything that could have stopped them. So it is this sort of cultural nationalism that goes alongside the nationalistic policy. Anybody else want to jump in and maybe talk about that? I'll mention something real quick, which is uh, at the end of the book, I talk about uh, various solutions. Um, like I said, I'm mm. an optimist, and I talk about uh, the potential for court reform and what that should look like, which I know we should have mentioned. I talk about um, uh, the way in which we should think about voting rights and this grand election compromise that I started the, I finally got to do that in the conclusion, like my advisor suggested. But I also talk about how we need you know, voter movements, basically, and, and one of them I discuss is that sometimes cases can turn into uh, popular movements and Citizens United is a good example. There's a great organization called literally End Citizens United, <laughs> which is trying to enter the public space and get people involved. Now, I sort of tongue in cheek say that the organization really should be called End Buckley after the 1976 <laughs> case that I think is more the root of the problem of uh, campaign finance issues. But, you know, wh why don't we have more end, you know, uh, and Anderson Burdick balancing. It's not very <laughs> catchy, but uh, but but it would do a lot of good. And ABCs. Yeah, exactly. So uh, so there is a role for you know kind of combining what we're all talking about here in using the the bad court cases to create popular conversations uh, of these issues, and that work is actually happening already.
Um, I, I agree with all of that. I think, I mean, just thinking at it about this question from the perspective of some of the work that the Brennan Center does, you know, we, you know, we, we think a lot about winning in the court of public opinion and, you know, that kind of public engagement as, as a really critical tool that we use as advocates and stepping back and thinking, as you're saying about how does change happen, you know, so much of that is, you know, needs to come from, from popular, popular mobilization um, and, and like there's an organizing related to that. Um, I guess something that we've been thinking a lot about and grappling with is just, um, you know, how to how to do that as, you know, media environments, et cetera, have been really changing um, over time. Um, you know, it's funny because for me, we just launched this, you know, website, kind of a news organization, essentially, you know, and then I'm I'm in meetings and, you know, with, you know, talking to people about, you know, different trends in terms of me media consumption. And it's like, oh, like young people don't read. They like consume all of their media through TikTok. And, you know, so some things that we've been, it's true. And, uh, you know, so things that we've been thinking about at the Brennan Center are just, you know, different ways of connecting with audiences that might not be consuming media in the ways that we're used to and that we have traditionally, you know, we write reports, we might like write a blog post, write an op-ed, you know, increasingly we're actually on TikTok. I do not personally have a TikTok account, but the Brennan Center does. I have done a TikTok video, hmm. um, you know, and, and different, you know, we, we have now a Spanish language um, site, Brennan and Espanol, um, you know, recognizing that as a, you know, very, you know, large community that um, was being underserviced in, in terms of getting, um, you know, access to, you know, some of the, the kinds of research and information that an, a Brennan, an organization like the Brennan Center has. So, you know, I just think there's both, I think this is both a story that, you know, is as old as America. How do you mobilize people? How do you, um, you know, what are the tools? But then also every generation, there's new tools, there's new challenges. And so, you know, I think part of what we're doing is, is figuring out how to do that work in the, the current information environment that we're in. I was going to just one thing about um, the immunity case. I mean, because that's the other place, I think, aside from voting rights, where recovery of American democracy isn't going to come from the courts. And, you know, there's a temptation, I think, to say about the decision, oh, it's subtle, it's presumptive immunity, it's only for official action, and maybe it's not so bad. I'm starting to see that kind of commentary. But of course, it's got a political result right now, which is that it's delaying the prosecution from the president if he wins, of Trump. And if he wins the presidency, then he's almost certainly immune as a sitting president period. So I guess that's another area where I think it's not just the popular movement, but it's with the aim of, in a specific way, recovering some principle and so legislation that would reverse the case, you know, is one way to do it. Another way would be legislation that's written narrowly that it might survive this court, you know, so that it could define, for instance, official duty in a very narrow way. It could build up the idea of the presumption um, uh, of, of, um, of overcoming the presumptive immunity and what might do it with serious crimes. But the problem here, and this is true with all of the things that we're talking about, is with this court, I just worry that that legislation itself would be struck down. Now we're back to square one. And so, you know, I'm, I'm interested to get to the end of the book and to hear about court reform. But I have gone from always defending against the idea of court packing or something. But I don't really see another way out when it comes to these fundamental defenses of democracy than to think about something more radical than allowing the current justices to remain in power. And so if Harris wins, I think there is a serious argument because it, we're talking about the pillars of democracy for um, something you know much stronger than uh, term limits, for instance, and, and whether it's court packing or some of the other plans that people have come up with of how to add justices the you know what we're talking about voting rights immunity for a criminal president these aren't minor things so i think that we're at the point where we have to start to think about pressuring the court and in all the cases that i'm talking about it wasn't that they just left the courts alone i mean the samuel chase case it's not just that jefferson won it's that they pushed back in a strong way against the court how did they do it they impeached chase and he was chastised he wasn't removed, but he was chastised. And so I think that kind of more aggressive politics is where we're at as a result of this, you know, this kind of conversation about the, 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 how perilous our, our democracy is. 
and I and, do want- and, and uh, presumptive immunity for official duties. There's your new organization, right? Yeah. Epiad <laughs> <laughs> and presumptive immunity. Yeah. I, like I was going to say, there is a sort of like a little feedback here, too, because you talked about all the problems that the court's causing in this. You write about it, obviously, and you're working in it, thinking about it. But, you know, this is a court that's causing these problems, and they never had the popular support, right? right? These were uh, jurists who were appointed by people who lost the popular vote and confirmed by a Senate who did not represent the majority of Americans. And so it... it it's a little ironic, I guess, scary even more. I, and, and I'm glad that people are coming across to the uh, coming to the point where they can see the necessity in this sort of core fundamental reform and don't treat the court as if it's just some entity out there watching over us, making sure that everything else is working right and that it's going to be on its own sort of clock working towards justice, democracy, and these sort of uh, values. I want to open it up to uh, the audience if there are any questions in here. Um, Professor? So first of all, thank you very much for this fantastic discussion. Um, my question is about the right. <laughs> <laughs> um, My question is about, again, this, this theme that's run through everything, uh, the courts are not going to save us. Um, and the question is who us is exactly in that statement and whether this is a statement about the particular ideology of the particular court we're confronted with or about courts just as a general matter, because there are certainly organizations now, the Pacific Legal Foundation, whatever it's called, the Institute for Justice, others that very much take Brown and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and Thurgood Marshall as exactly their model and are trying to do exactly the same thing, but for fundamentally conservative causes. Um, and do you think that the courts might save them? That is, is this a sensible strategy for such organizations to, through litigation, try and over time and carefully selected cases and taking the long view and picking sympathetic plaintiffs and so on um, to move law and society in that direction. And they will fail too because courts courts only can do so much. Courts can't, can't fundamentally change social commitments, social values, the nature of society. Or is it that we have a very strongly right-wing ideological court, and it may actually, um, courts courts can do all those things, and the particular problem is the ideology of the current set of justices. So that's a question for any one of you, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it, it, if you have a sympathetic court and it aligns with your ideology, and this is an ideological court, there are all sorts of ways that you could just start to bring cases that are going to stymie, well, democracy. So in the area of religious freedom or free exercise, for instance, that, that seems like one area where the court is looking to uh, expand ideas of religious freedom in order to limit um, uh, gay rights, for instance, and the gains that were, were made there. Uh, you know, there was a period of time where I think democracy, and as you talked about, progressive causes could look to the courts too. And I think that motivated Marshall at the time that there was enough alignment, but I don't see it happening now at this, this stage. And so I think, you know, that's why this more radical way of doing it. I think too, you know, I saw, I saw it during the confirmation of um, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, you know, this sort of normalization of what they were doing, despite the fact that Gorsuch had written a dissertation where he, compared, um, uh, uh, talked about uh, bestiality and gay rights in the same way. And Kavanaugh had written a piece that he gave at Minnesota Law School about uh, U.S. versus Nixon being wrong. <laughs> and, you know, even if it's not wrong of narrowing it so exactly what they did so that it really only stands for the idea that a sitting president could be subject to a criminal subpoena, but not that a president is above the law in any way. So I guess that's the sort of moment that we're at now is to realize that this court is really not far from neutral or something that we could work with. It, it is in the way of 
democracy. And so, you know, I believe in the possibility of courts. I believe in judicial review. I'd love to see a court that defended basic rights and certainly believe in privacy and the right to an abortion. But this court is not that. And I guess my point in talking about Dred Scott and Chase and um, the end of Reconstruction, the civil rights cases, um, or in, Crook, uh, in the Crookshank case, you know that what those are those are the dominant moments. So we we've, we've seen this before. Now it's not that we haven't prevailed. Democracy has prevailed over it by pushing back in in a strong way against the courts. But I think that we're so in the mode of the Warren Court and its legacy, <laughs> and Thurgood Marshall in particular in the litigator moment that. You know, it, we're we're too, I think, lacking in the aggressiveness that we need towards the court. I mean, that's part of the point, frankly, of telling the King and Marshall story. Like, yeah, he he was great for that court, but it was King who saw the more powerful, stronger strategy. And if I had to think about who did more to save American democracy between the two, and just just to I, I said a lot of it, but like King actually opposed all the civil disobedience. Of this, I mean, sorry. Marshall opposed the strategy of civil disobedience. He thought that letter from a Birmingham jail was like an F minus, like totally wrong on all part. And so part of what I'm trying to say is like, you know, King had the better argument there. And especially for a moment, it's King that we have to look to, not Marshall. I'll just jump in to make a couple of points. I think so I, I mean, I agree that this court is has really embraced a, an extreme ideology. Uh, I, I do think that there is still and always a place for public outrage and pushback. And I do think that that can have an impact even on this court, as shameless as, <laughs> as it has been. You know, I, I do think that it is. It, it continues to be very important for people to um, to be kind of narrating what's happening, for people to be con continue to be outraged and to kind of make the connections between court decisions and then the impacts that you're seeing um, on people's lives. Um, I guess two other points I just wanted to to raise. One is that. It's it's a, such a hard thing because you still need the courts, and I mean maybe this is also where I think you know we have to also think about state courts and other places as as other venues to look to because when you think about well how do people like well how can people express that outrage if they're not you know having effect you know if they're not having an effective right to protest if they're not able to have their votes count you know if if there are basic kind of democratic values aren't being protected and we often see, you know, our political bodies not not protecting those rights, then, um, you know, it's going to be very hard for people to actually, you know, serve that counterbalance and ultimately, um, you know, have the kind of popular mobilization that that we need and that I do believe is ultimately the thing that that will save us. But if you don't have a kind of basis of fundamental rights and, you know, democratic protections, it gets a lot harder to do that. Um, and so, you know, I sort of come back to the fact that, you know, courts won't save you, but courts are also really important bulwarks. And so it's important to do the work to try to get to create institutions that are fair and are going to be playing the role that we kind of need them to play in our democracy. And I guess to that end, I do want to thinking about different kinds of court reforms. I, I guess I, I do want to make a, a pitch for for term limits as something that I think is is a significant transformational reform. I mean, I, I, I understand the, the case for um, court packing. I mean, I, I understand the moment, you know, why, why people think that that might be um, the direction to go. I, I worry that, that, that there's no end point to that, mm -hmm. that, you know, there's, that it can kind of lead to, um, you know, kind of just further and further escalation that doesn't actually, that ultimately won't sort of solve the problems that we're facing right now. You know, I think something like term limits, if it's done in a way where, um, you know, every president gets, you know, if you have 18 year terms, every president gets two um, seats to fill in a, in a four year term, you can start creating more of a democratic link between the court and the public that, you know, the court can kind of evolve over time in ways that, um, you know, might might mitigate some of what we're we're seeing in the the current moment, you know, and I mean, to what what we were saying earlier, right, like, it's, you know, we have a court now that, you know, it's it's wild that, you know, presidents can have, you know, three, three seats filled in a single um, presidential term or zero. 
um, you know, and we've we've seen both in recent history. So, um, you, you know, I think that that term limits is, an, to me at least, an intriguing reform because it does that. It creates more of a democratic link, but in a way that still protects judicial independence, which is, I think, also an important value. So you asked who the us are, and I want to address that, and also quickly on on court reform. I think the the us is we the people, right? I mean, it's the Declaration of Independence says a government is not legitimate except for the consent of the governed, and yet we have a system that's set up that it's only a small fraction of the governed that actually has a say in democratic representation. And the court's not the only reason that that exists. I mean, we have the Electoral College and the misrepresentation that uh, it comes from the Senate, but the court's rulings certainly have created a regime in which the consent of the governed is a fewer and fewer of us. And so I think that's one of the, the big things that that I would look to in terms of uh, how to fix the system. Uh, with respect to court packing, I'm actually not a big fan of it because of what you suggested, right? Is this just an ideological court? Because, you know, if Democrats add members of the court because, you know, my buddy from Kentucky McConnell stole some seats, uh, then when Republicans take over, they'll add some. And then Democrats take over and they'll add some. And it's a tit for tat with with no end game. And, um, you know, I'm someone who believes that uh, election reforms to be most legitimate should be a bipartisan measure. Uh, I'm a big baseball fan. If the Yankees and the Mets both make both make the World Series this year, uh, and, you know, it would be totally unfair for the Yankees to get to choose the umpires and also the rules of the game that game seven's played under, right? No one besides the most closed-minded diehard Yankee fan would think that's the right way to do things. And that's kind of how we run uh, elections now. And I think if the Democrats just said, well, we're going to, you know, the courts are legitimate, so we're going to add members. You know, how could you ever get a Republican to say that's legitimate? I think there are other reforms that uh, can get a veneer of bipartisanship that make a lot of sense. Uh, in the book, I talk about um, having justices sit in panels like the lower courts do. I suggest uh, having district judges and court of appeals judges sit by designation on the Supreme Court, um, just like they do on each other's courts, to create a, a more of a rotation of who's on the court to hopefully lower the temperature of the ideological decisions so we you know know less that this case is going to be a 6-3 or a 5-4. And I do think term limits also would uh, help to create a rotation of justices, would lower the temperature of the nomination battle. Um, you know, my book came out in May and, and Joe Biden actually came out with um, a proposal on term limits in either June or July. So I assume he read the book. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no. So lots of other people have come up with this idea too, of course. Uh, but that is something that I think we need to think long term about uh, institutional reforms that can lower the temperature of what's going on at the court. I mean, just a quick one last thing, which is to say, you know, I think certainly thinking about voting rights and, and mass participation is fundamental in democracy, but it also is about other two other things that I'm trying to emphasize that I think are under dire immediate threat. One is uh, the idea that no person is above the law. And so the immunity case, I don't think is just anything. I think that's the Patrick Henry warning and democracy really might not survive another Trump presidency. If you think of what the immunity case is about, of course, it's the self-coup of January 6th. So I, I think the, you know, the, the issue of immunity has made things really immediate and pressing. And the other one that I started with is the right to dissent. And you know, with Trump promising to shut down opposition, he's not joking about it. Can he succeed? We can talk about that. But certainly there are ways... I think that he could succeed, you know, weaponizing special counsels, for instance. So I think that it has to do, you know, and not that I disagree with either of the proposals that you've both made, but I guess what I'm thinking about is the the kind of immediacy of the danger and the, the threat. And I, I put it, you know, code red or, you know, DEFCON 6 or whatever the number is. And, you know, and especially when we think about not just voting, but but as important as that is, but these other two issues, which are, you know, he is a threat to democracy. That's really what what we're talking about. And that's what's in the background. If he wins, there, there, and he has the court, then it might not be the kind of thing where there is a recovery. It might it might be the end of the whole the whole project. And you know, the presidency is so powerful right now, and the control over the Department of Justice. And he saw last time that the bureaucracy was going to stop him so he understands how to undermine things like the Pendleton Act 
So I, I really think that the threat is, now if he loses, we might have more, I think we do have more time, but if he wins, the, you know, the stuff that we're talking about might, might be immediate rather than long-term. It's very interesting. I just want to pick up on a couple of threads that you threw out there. One is that the sort of learning Trump has had. And just to be clear, I had coffee with Corey earlier and I was saying how I loved it, how the book wasn't so focused on Trump. And Josh's book is not so focused on Trump. And here I thought we were going to get through a conversation without <laughs> being on Trump. But, you know, there we go. Um, but, I, I, you know, this goes back to your sort of earlier point, how you said these were some of the most preeminent people in their studies of the Constitution that ended up leading to the degradation of democracy in these specific periods. And Trump didn't have any of that. He was not thoughtful about the Constitution. Whatever he was thoughtful about was not the Constitution, right? right? And he was certainly not trained in it. And so now there's been this period where there has been some learning and there certainly has been uh, his own constituency or potential personnel to help him kind of think through those problems. And so I, I think that that's interesting. It's also interesting that you bring up the immunity case where Biden was very much about keeping the Supreme yep. Court exactly what it was. And it seems to be the immunity case that pushed him over the edge to say, oh, I will think about these things that my commission looked at, right? And these are real problems. But I'd say it's kind of an all of above thing because if we think about this as only being a unique court that's on its own bent and it's certain set of ideologies or unifying ideology, I don't know. I mean, that just sets us up for the next court that's going to do that. And I think that there is a sense of the immediacy of the danger, but we also can think about ways of framing it so it doesn't come off as that, right? So we have a court that is taking far less cases than ever before, right? We're, we're, we're back to the 19, 1850s times, right? And, and it's a small court. So maybe that's a reason itself to expand the court to at least fit the number of circuits that we have. So you have a justice mm -hmm. presiding over each of those. We can sort of like think about the problems themselves and, and solve other problems while we're doing it, right? And so I, I think of this as more of an all of the above mm -hmm. thing. One thing that wasn't spoken about was jurisdiction. We can talk about, people talk about stripping jurisdiction, but we can also expand jurisdiction and think about ways so it's not so that the Supreme Court is choosing which cases that comes before it, right? In this way that it, it kind of does have a little bit of an ability to decide what questions and what issues of democracy are gonna be before him and set and on the agenda. And so I think that there's a way to kind of think about this. I'd love for it to be bipartisan. It doesn't seem to me at this moment that we're getting much of anything bipartisan done. And so that that is my fear. I want to uh, other questions. Timing. All right, time check. I'm told that we do not have time right now. So <laughs> um, I do want to just uh, say a personal point of privilege. Uh, this is my first external facing event where it's public. So I'm really happy to be here. But it was important for me to have people up here who uh, have done and meant uh, a lot to me. Um, Josh probably doesn't even realize it, but when I came into the academy during COVID, his was the first non-COVID symposium I was invited to speak <laughs> at. So it was very important for me. And as I said, your work has been so influential for me. Uh, Corey was my college professor. So yeah. that was great. And one of the two professors, along with advisor, made me really confident that I wanted to become a lawyer by taking his class. And Alicia is just fantastic. I worked with her at the Brennan Center during my time before the Academy and even still to this day. There is nothing that she, uh, she doesn't say enough. Um, I'll say it that um, because whenever she does, you should be listening. She's worn many hats at the Brennan Center and beyond. And so for me, it is a personal point of privilege to have you all three here on this event. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to have dinner with you guys. After. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you, everybody else, for coming out, everybody uh, watching this. And again, a special thanks to Michael, my uh, co-director, Jillian, Sam, and of course, he, who makes all the magic happen. And the Florence Simer Center is going to try to bring more pro programming like this. So thank you.